Sivezi kiniso sivusele la utembega. Next, since you know it's day two and we're focusing on innovation, next we're looking at media survival in the digital era. Monetizing digital news platforms such as Facebook, Twitter, Instagram for media sustainability. Teresa Ndanga, who is the chairperson of Misa Malawi, uh, will be joining us for that. How do we do meaningful work? How do we make the stories? But also fundamentally, how do we monetize? Uh, Teresa, over to you. Thank you so much, uh, Patrick. I will switch on my video um, temporarily. My network connection is a bit, a bit, bit low, um, uh, but I will try to keep it uh, until such a time maybe that I see it's getting weaker. I will then um, probably switch it off. Allow me to also um, share my screen uh, for my presentation. Uh, just a minute. I hope you can see my screen. Okay. So as um, Patrick has already indicated, my name is Teresa Chirandanga. I'm the current chairperson for MISA Malawi, the Media Institute of Southern Africa. And as you may already know, uh, MISA, MISA is in um, several countries in the southern part of Africa. And uh, we have a chapter here, which I am currently leading. I am also a media trainer. I particularly train um, uh, journalists in investigative journalism, but also train uh, communicators, um, public relations uh, officers, managers, and people who generally speak to the media, CEOs and so forth in both the public and private sectors. And I am also a media consultant um, doing work for uh, on a consultancy basis. I also work with a company called HL Group and that's my main employment. I'm the public relations manager there. So I'll be talking about media survival in the digital era as Patrick has already indicated. How do we ensure that um, uh, we are monetizing digital news platforms and ensure that we are making uh, media sustainable? Um, some of the things that I will definitely be talking about are building up on the things that we have already heard from previous speakers uh, from the first day. And of course, uh, Paula has also uh, touched on some of the issues that I may also try to um, touch a bit in my presentation. Uh, but generally, this presentation will look back um, in Malawi. Where are we coming from? So we will talk about the past a little bit so that we have a bit of some context context um, on where Malawi is coming from or the Malawi media is coming from. And then we will now talk about the current situation, our now, how traditional media has been impacted by COVID-19 and of course uh, the rise in internet usage because that has also had um, both some negative and positive implications. I will then still um, in the present time talk about monetizing digital platforms and um, uh, primarily talk about the experience in the Malawi media. Uh, and I will be giving uh, some examples that we have seen as success stories in terms of monetizing digital platforms. And uh, then we'll move on to the future. How does the future look like? Um, are there any possible opportunities that we may be looking at? Um, uh, of course, um, based on what we have seen now, and of course, from where we are coming from. So basically to give you a bit of some context in terms of where the Malawi media, how the journey for the Malawi media has been, um, just as many African countries, um, we're coming from a time where we only had one media house and that was a part of the public uh, broadcaster. We, by law, it's a public broadcaster, even though in terms of the operations, I would say at that particular time, it was primarily a state broadcaster. So we only had one at that particular time until 1994. And um, as you may guess, this is a time that uh, we saw the advent of democracy in Malawi. And uh, with that also came um, the, 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 the 
coming in of several other media houses. So we saw uh, more radio stations, um, more TV stations. At least at that time, there was not uh, TV stations uh, um, in the past. And then with the coming in of democracy, there now came TV, at least at one at that time, it was also the state broadcaster. Um, uh, but as we speak right now, we have over 80 uh, broadcast media organizations. And these are a range, uh, they range from city broadcasters, uh, private broadcasters, the public broadcaster. The public broadcaster alone has uh, Radio One, which was um, the radio station that we used to know in the past. Um, uh, and uh, Radio Two, which is more a bit more modern. And they also have uh, the television station. Um, we also have a number of print um, media houses uh, publishing on a daily basis um, at the weekend or on a Sunday, and some, of course, um, publishing um, fortnightly and so forth. Then now we're talking about the digital era, which has seen a lot of online media um, coming up. Um, and uh, this, I would say, I would categorize in two forms. Um, there are those that um, are owned by the traditional media houses. So you have radio stations that uh, came about some years back, and now with the coming in or the growth of um, the digital platforms, now they are also getting themselves on the digital platforms. But you're also having those that are, you know, the, the they are their main platform is just um, uh, online. Um, so we've also seen a lot, a lot of those. And with that as well, we have seen a lot of citizen journalism uh, where people just generally can publish anywhere on their Facebook pages and so forth. So that's where we are right now. Um, uh, but obviously we are also seeing some complementarity between uh, different media, media um, organizations or platforms um, where, as I said, a kind of a combination um, uh, digital and of course the traditional one, modern and the traditional one. Yeah. So we we are we are at that particular level. Um, the only worry um, at the at this at this particular time, obviously, the things that we already know and the things that have already been highlighted by some um, some of the the speakers that have spoken before me, uh, are the fact that uh, with this has we have also seen the rise in mis misinformation um, in Malawi, and of course I also know that this is also the case with other countries as well. Now, looking at the impact of uh, COVID-19 in, in, uh, on the media in Malawi, uh, Paula mentioned this as well, um, uh, that in South Africa, they also saw some of the challenges that we have seen in Malawi. Um, uh, there was a decline in revenue and revenue sources, and this was huge. Um, uh, as you know, um, where we're coming from, media houses survival was mainly dependent on advertising, and that is for radio and that is for print. Um, but with the coming in of COVID-19, suddenly there was no advertising that was flowing for the newspapers and, of course, for the radio stations. Partly it's because um, you know, there was businesses closed down or sometimes uh, primary, maybe suspended a little bit. And during that particular time, they didn't see the need for them to advertise. And at least at the beginning of the pandemic, um, most organizations, most businesses had not thought innovatively of how they would still sustain their businesses at a time when we were facing a pandemic. So there was a sharp decline in terms of revenue. And uh, that also impacted the operations of um, the several media houses, um, one of which was the scale down of programming for broadcast media. So we could actually see um, that at, before COVID, we had you know, quality programs, we had numerous in terms of quantity, uh, we had good programs, a number of them, but suddenly the, there was a bit of a decline. And it's because the source of funding was no longer there. Um, uh, so that was a big worry for us in terms of at the time when you want the media to be giving out quality information, we have the rise in, in, in misinformation, but we are also in reality being impacted such that the programs were also being scaled down. So that was a huge worry for, for the media sector um, when we wanted to be giving out information, we now forced to scale down a little bit. 
And the scaling down was also because um, it was a bit difficult for the media organizations to be going out to source news at a time when there were restrictions in place. And where do you go? Where do you find the people that you have to speak to? So at this earlier stage of the pandemic, it was a bit difficult to, to begin to adjust. Um, and therefore, uh, that, that was one of the reasons that we, we saw a scale down in terms of the, the programs in broadcast media. And as Paula said as well, there were salary cuts here as well in Malawi. I know of a situation where people had to take a, a cut of about 40%. And, and, and when you expect that you know, your salary should be rising um, to match the cost of living, it was, it was being cut. And the journalists didn't have a choice really. It's either they keep a job, at least get something, even though now it's smaller, it's smaller package, or they don't have a job. So it was the kind of a compromise that they had to reach with their management. Uh, unfortunate as it, as it is, but it was also a reality um, that we needed to face. And unfortunately, um, we have also seen a closure of some media houses that simply cannot sustain their operations. Um, uh, and, 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 and these um, have been both in broadcast and of course in print. Some will just disappear from the streets in terms of the print, uh, the newspapers, um, and for the radio stations, um, uh, we have seen that, you know, um, uh, maybe they will slow down a little bit or indeed um, just close down. So that's, that was quite huge in terms of the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. But there was also um, a positive trend that we also see. So um, uh, with the coming in of um, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, there was a rise in terms of internet usage among us Malawians. Um, we are coming from a time when um, internet usage in Malawi was just uh, around 10%. Uh, but during the COVID-19 pandemic, and I must say that uh, this is coming from the graph here is um, by the Malawi Communications Regulatory Authority, um, MACRA, it's a regulatory body for the broadcast media and of course the telecommunications sector. But they're saying that, you know, the, there was a, a rise in internet usage um, during the COVID-19 pandemic. So the last quarter of 2019, as you can see the figures, um, it was right, uh, just close to nine, nine million. Um, uh, but of course it went slightly above um, in the third quarter of 2020. Of course, most people are really using mobile data on their phones, but we, you can also see from the, the blue graphs that there's been also a rise in broadband usage. So while yes, uh, most people are using mobile data on their phones, um, but there's still a rise in terms of usage of broadband. Um, so generally now, internet access in Malawi is at 14%. It's still low. It's still something that we would want to see improve, but there are factors that I will definitely later on speak about that kind of restrict or limit us in terms of um, the penetration of the internet um, in Malawi. Um, uh, but this was a positive trend. And therefore now it was up to the media to begin to see how do you take advantage of this current situation where there's been a rise um, in people that are looking at or using the internet. Can the media now get on those platforms where people are using the internet more to reach out to these people? Can they now get on these platforms to be able to get some money out of these platforms? That was now the question, but this was now presented itself as the opportunity. You know? So the negative implications obviously for the rise in internet usage was that uh, they, there was more competition uh, for media houses. Um, we did see that um, now people were able to um, as unfortunate as it may be, um, some people were able to just open um, open you know the the the, the establish their own online uh, um, online news websites and so forth, simply because you know they also saw that many people are on, on the internet now. So it meant more competition. And for a, a sector that is already struggling, that meant that they needed to be a little bit more creative if they were to favorably compete and uh, make some headway um, in the current environment. Again, some companies didn't see now the need for them to advertise, continue to advertise with the traditional media. Um, 
um, traditional media as they used to do in the past. So there was a loss of revenue um, because now the businesses relied on their own Facebook pages, their own websites, I mean, their own Twitter handles and, and so forth. So it was now a bit more, even more difficult uh, for the media. But as I said earlier on, it was also an opportunity for some innovative media houses. So, and definitely some became quite innovative and began to make money uh, with the coming in of uh, the rise uh, in the use of the internet um, in Malawi with the coming in of COVID the COVID-19 pandemic. The first example that I want to cite is a startup um, a company, media company called iHub. iHub Online uh, started in 2019, November. And, and as you know, that was close to uh, the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic. So they started in November and a few months down the line, COVID came, Malawi began to feel the effects and obviously for a startup, um, you know, they're just starting, resources are not readily available. It was very, very difficult for them to continue with their operations. And as soon as they started, unfortunately, they, they couldn't find, you know, funding, funding streams were drying up and it was difficult to continue to run um, their online news sites. And uh, they suspended uh, their operations a little bit. But again, as time went, uh, they found that, you know, with COVID-19, there are also opportunities that we may uh, utilize. And as now we speak, um, the iHub uh, online is now a startup that is quite successful at its stage just started in 2009, uh, but right now they are one of the leading um, uh, live streaming uh, platforms. They have uh, acquired a, some good quality equipment um, uh, that they're using and they're getting a lot of you know, business um, coming from um, uh, businesses or companies and even the public sector. Uh, so even the government, when they have events, they are usually the ones that are being hired now to live stream. And that idea just came about because, you know, at the, at the, when COVID struck, we couldn't meet physically. And as we're doing right now, most times we uh, were forced to have online meetings. And they saw an opportunity and said, you know, in Malawi, there are very few companies, if any, that are doing this. And they went for it got a bit of some funding um, and, uh, and, and purchased equipment and started, you know, advertising themselves, aggressively marketing themselves such that they began to be noticed and they were, be, they were being hired. And that was their initial um, um, uh, way of making a lot of money from online platforms. And, and they, they would live stream usually on, on Facebook. So in Malawi, there are a lot of users on Facebook, of course, Twitter a, a, a bit, but many people will be on Facebook and that's where I have is usually live streaming. Uh, so they would stream uh, live stream on their, on their Facebook pages and of course their clients page. Um, so as you can see, a number of events already that I've put up and some big, big companies, organizations uh, really hiring this startup um, company that has just been there for some two years or so. And as you can see, even, even SADC, yeah, they're able to live stream for big organizations such as, as SADC. And that is, what, that is simply because they saw an opportunity. There was a gap uh, at that particular time. Even the television companies um, had not seen that opportunity uh, for them to go into live streaming uh, using their online pages or their, or their online platforms. And I have a small company, a small startup at that particular time, uh, grabbed that opportunity and went for it. They have also become creative. You know how in most African countries, um, the Malawi inclusive, it's a bit uh, sensitive to talk about certain topics such as um, the, the issue to do with homosexuality. And in normal media houses, it's difficult to, to have these open discussions about uh, sensitive issues such as homosexuality. And that's where they also saw an opportunity to say, you know what, we don't need to go to MACRA to get a license, um, to the regulator to get a license uh, to be able to run our online television. So right now they are doing online TV, discussing topics that are rarely discussed in, on, on Malawi media, and there's funding for that. So they went 
for in is is a topic that they knew that there will be very um, little competition for and applied for uh, grants uh, for 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 that particular um for for those particular topics they got that they don't need to go through licensing uh, to be able to run live programs um so they will have panel discussions um but it's online and they're discussing quite an important topic even as sensitive as it may be so you, as you can see they're tackling now cyber bullying for the the LGBTQI uh, community in Malawi. They talk about certain, you know, issues rarely discussed in, in um, the mainstream media, such as suicide uh, and, and so forth. So I have is a very good example of a startup that has been quite a success just during the pandemic um, and with the coming or the rise, rising use of, um, of online or digital digital platforms. As we speak right now, um, the iHub team started with only one individual in November 2019. Only one individual had an idea and started his operations. I could see him and his wife trying to, you know, um, do this and that uh, simply because there was no funding at that particular time and they were doing this on their own. As we speak right now, it's a team of about 10 people and it's still growing. They are currently running projects for big organizations such as the UN. So they have won donor confidence just during this particular time in the past two years alone. They are funding a number, I mean, they're running right now a number of funded projects. So they already know that uh, for the next uh, two or three years, you know, we have these projects that we are running. Very relevant to the situation. And that's what I like about their projects. They will make sure that they are talking about issues that are particularly relevant at that particular time, but maybe zero in on a community that is really talked about. So for instance, they will zero in on children, knowing that children are really uh, taken on board on mainstream media as news sources and so forth and get funding from UNICEF. You know? So they are unique in the sense that they're able to recognize where the gap is and where there is less competition and go for it and get big funding uh, for their projects. And as you can see, uh, they are financially quite stable at this particular time. Another example um, that I want to cite is uh, that of uh, print. Um, uh, so the leading um, organizations that um, we, we, I mean, leading newspapers that we have right now in Malawi are the Nation newspaper and the Times newspaper. So some of the things that I'm talking about on this slide are things that are both for, for the two um, uh, newspapers. And of course, it also speaks for other newspapers in the country as well. The first that we saw with uh, the pandemic, as I already alluded to in the beginning, is the declining circulation um, and it worsened uh, with the use of internet or the rising use of the internet in Malawi. So circulation has been going down over the years. Um, not as many people are buying the newspapers on the street. It's most times news organizations, I mean, organizations buying for, for their companies, but in terms of at individual level, very few people are buying newspapers um, on the street. So the circulation has been going down and that has worsened with the COVID-19 pandemic and the internet usage as well. So many people now have turned to the internet for their news and not necessarily going to buy a newspaper on the street. As mentioned earlier on, excuse me, as mentioned earlier on, there's also been a decline in advertising. So with the pandemic, advertising was not easy to come by. Marketers were not able to go to source um, advertising. Offices were closed. So where do they get this, this, um, the, these, these businesses? So it was a bit difficult. And we saw that in addition to circulation um, declining, uh, advertising also went down. But there was improved online presence. So for both newspapers, um, they got, now they tend to where the audience was going. So the audience is now getting on online platforms. Let's get them where they are. So their online presence has really increased in the past two or three years. Um, uh, and, and this is where they are engaging uh, with their, their audience, getting constant feedback, 
immediate feedback, unlike maybe in the newspapers where they publish and, and that is all, they don't get to hear immediately uh, from their audiences. But there's more engagement now and they are trying to use, um, give content uh, that obviously they're seeing more and more people having a hunger for. So there's constant improvement and uh, they, their presence online has been quite, um, uh, quite big uh, during the past uh, three, three or so years. They also went to now advertise online. So as you can see, they'll actually carry online um, advertising for different uh, organizations or companies. Um, and it's mostly on Facebook and, and their websites. Um, so with, with COVID-19 as well, we also saw that you know, we, are, we lost a lot of lives. And many people would also use these two newspapers or the pages, online pages for these two newspapers to announce deaths, you know, um, because it, it was happening so fast. There was no time to process. And they saw that, you know, for them to get to relatives and friends on the passing of someone, because someone passes this morning, they are buried um, in the afternoon or so. The quickest way to get communication out there was to use established media houses that already have a huge following. And so we also saw a lot of advertising coming from um, the effects of the COVID-19 on families and so forth. So a lot of advertising as well was also coming in um, because of the impact of uh, the COVID-19 on individuals, on families, and on their nation. Times also has a television station. So Times has a television radio station and the newspaper sign. So they now also um, diversified by having the television section live stream just as I have are doing. So they, they now are also live streaming quite a lot, um, especially on their page um, as well. And that business is still there even as we speak right now. For the nation newspaper, quite unique is their um, e-newspaper. Of course, Times also has their own e-newspaper. And the nation states that this is where the biggest revenue has streamed from in the past uh, two or three years. And their main target is the diaspora. Because as I mentioned earlier on, in Malawi, internet access is just at 14%. And you can't guarantee that you know, people will buy the e-newspaper, have the experience of the print uh, newspaper uh, through the e-newspaper. They would just maybe want to read um, the news on online pages. So they targeted a specific audience, and that is the Malawian uh, citizens that are abroad. They would still want to keep up with the local news and so forth. So they targeted those, and this is where the, the most revenue is coming from. A lot of subscribers are in the diaspora. And as you can imagine, the payment is in foreign currency. So when that is converted to the Malawian currency, it's a bit more money uh, for, for um, the nation newspaper. So they're making quite a lot of money uh, from, from um, the e-newspapers, and uh, they are still continuing um, to market that, uh, to get more and more users as circulation in print. Um, their actual hard copy is declining. They hope to increase on the e-newspapers. Um, I, I would also now like to talk about the broadcast example, which is Zodiac. So, of course, Zodiac also has uh, a television station, radio station, um, and the online pages. So, just as the other um, media houses, they, they were also into live streaming. Um, they were also doing all, all that, you know, advertising on, on Facebook. But what one unique example that I've picked from Zodiac is usage of SMS. So the normal texting um, uh, that we do, you don't really need um, you know, a, an internet connection uh, for, for this innovation. So for them, they felt you know, the majority of Malawians are not on the internet. So if we're saying, so obviously close to 80%, you know, can't access the internet of, in, in Malawi. But how do we still make money from the 80% using you know, uh, modern technology, using the phone? And they thought that, you know, we could use SMS. So they have a platform where they text breaking news um, to um, subscribers. 
And uh, they do that through the, the, the two big um, uh, you know, networks in Malawi. So we have two, uh, Airtel and TNM. So they reached an agreement with these two that they should be using their platforms uh, to be able to text to subscribers news as it happens. So breaking news, um, um, and, and they are well known for breaking news. Actually, when they were starting, it was their, mo their motto kind of. Um, they, you hear it first uh, from Zodiac when, when something happens. And they built on that to say, you know, we can also monetize this motto uh, through SMS by reaching out to more people. Uh, you don't need an internet. So they, they are reaching out right now. Their subscriber base is currently at 560,000. For the for the for the SMS platform, and the arrangement is that you know they will use this platform for by the the network providers, and the network they will get a commission out of it. So for the for for TNM they get uh, thirty percent, and TNM gets seventy, which of course I do find a bit uh, a bit unfair. Um, but uh, the mobile uh, network providers are kind of stuck um, on that. And uh, for Airtel, it's uh, 40, 60. Um, but it's still some substantial amount of money uh, that they are making out of the SMS platform. Zodiac also uses a lot of combo advertising. So when they go out to sell themselves, they will not just market um, Facebook. So they will combine and say, we have a combined audience of 7.6 million. But Advertise with us, you are advertising on radio, television, and of course, on Facebook. So as I say, it's mostly Facebook here. Uh, we have not yet started to fully monetize Twitter and other digital platforms. So that number, when they mention the combined figure of the audience, it kind of speaks to what someone would want to, to get in the end. So it's very easy for them to um, ad get, get advertising with that sense. And by the way, they are the currently, they are the currently um, the most followed news page um, on Facebook, at least in Malawi. So um, there are of course challenges um, still um, unique to Malawi. Uh, uh, in terms of monetizing digital platforms. The first one is that, you know, there's limited internet penetration. So Malawi ranks 46 in Africa, uh, where um, internet, when we talk of access to the internet, and as I mentioned, it's just 14%. In fact, it's 13.8. So as you can see, it's very low, lowest in the region, um, the southern part of, of Africa and quite, um, we know, we rank towards the end of the list in Africa. Our data is very, very high. You know, access is slow, is low, but we also have one of the highest costs. So in Africa, we rank third. Um, in terms of figures, um, just to paint a picture, um, one gigabyte costs around $25 for us. So that's very, very expensive for a poor country uh, such as Malawi. And that's a bit difficult. So how are you going to monetize um, digital platforms when there are all these challenges, access, and even uh, the cost of data? But again, we are not just looking at the external challenges. We also have our own challenge. And that is to say, not as many media houses in Malawi currently um, have the capacity and understanding uh, that they can monetize uh, digital platforms as, as tools to generate resources. So that's, that, that's still a bit slow. And that's something that we really need to look at. But there is um, some opportunities. There are some opportunities as well. In terms of broad and external opportunities, the, the biggest one is that we do have uh, a favorable and progressive policy and legal framework um, in Malawi that supports uh, the growth of um, the internet or the ICT sector in Malawi. So the 2013 National ICT Policy provides for universal access to the internet. Now, this sounds really, really good on paper, um, uh, but we are quite far in terms of getting to universal access, as, as you can see from the figures that I already pointed out on. Um, but there's still some progress towards that direction. 
the government um, started some few years back to establish what they call telecenters. So they're constructing, you know, places in rural areas, in districts where people can access the internet. So they put the, the computers there, uh, have internet access and people and quite affordable access, quite affordable uh, internet. But in terms of implementation, there have been structures that have been built, but they, they remain unused simply because again, literacy in terms of using those, um, the, the, the equipment that has been put there is still very low. So you can put it, but there's no one to utilize it because they don't know how. So that's one of the biggest challenges that we have seen in terms of telecenters. Now the government is switching to say, maybe internet usage should start with primary schools. And that's where they're going now, the current administration. So hopefully when we start with the kids, it might grow as we, as, as we go forward into the future. They're also installing fiber optic across the country. And this will at least maybe um, have an impact in terms of reducing the cost of data. There's also the Communications Act of 2016 that provides for the Universal Service Fund. So service providers such as the mobile service providers uh, pay a little something to the Malawi Communications Regulatory Authority. And that uh, th those resources help in terms of bringing ICT closer to the rural um, and underserved areas. But in terms of practicality as well, there's no one who is really monitoring to see where this money is going, how it's being utilized. We're not asking those questions as yet and yet the universal service fund is currently operational and this is something that paula already mentioned um, i'm putting question marks as something that we all we all need to think about um, areas that we now have control on this is our own for internal um, Let's look into areas such as podcasting. For countries like, such as Malawi, podcasting is still very low in terms of monetizing it. Um, we're not there yet. Even, in fact, even uh, just podcasting where you're not making money is very low usage. So maybe this is an area that we could also look at and see how we can monetize it. I know some other African countries are already quite ahead of us in terms of uh, this particular area, but this is something that we need to look at. Paula mentioned entrepreneurial journalism. Can the educational facilities, educational institutions, journalism educational institutions also look at how we inculcate a culture of entrepreneurial journalism in the training schools so that when um, students graduate, get into the industry, they're already thinking business or monetizing journalism, monetizing um, the modern journalism that we currently know of. TikTok, Instagram, uh, we already heard from Marcus and, 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 and colleague yesterday, I mean, on the first day, uh, where they talked about news on TikTok. But can we also think more about news, yes, but also monetizing? Are there any ways that we can think of monetizing TikTok? Yeah. Um, something that, again, kind of drags us a little bit is the spirit of individualism. So everyone wants to do you know, their own thing. This is my thing. We don't kind of bring forces together, work collaboratively, bring resources together. Because generally, if you look at borrowing uh, to, 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 for uh, media investments, it's very difficult because the media is considered to be quite a risky business. So not, no, no bank or organizations are willing to kind of borrow uh, the media money uh, for investments. So how do we kind of utilize the little, little resources that each one of us may have to bring together uh, for more online or more in, um, digital investments? That's something that maybe we can think of. And paid for courses, short courses. Again, uh, Paula also mentioned a bit on, on WhatsApp. This is something that has already been tested in terms of running you know, short courses on online platforms such as WhatsApp. But can we monetize that, get a bit of some money out, out of it? Otherwise, um, good journalism is what sells. And again, Paula really did very well, did justice in terms of where the public trusts you, that's when they will be willing to spend a bit of some money um, uh, for, for, the, for the news. So we really need to look at how, while we're yes thinking of monetizing, it's not just about monetizing it. It's about ensuring that we are getting creative with ensuring that we are credible. 
we are credible, we have the trust that we need from the general public, and that's why they will be able to pay for the service that we are offering. Otherwise, it would be very difficult to get that if we, are, we can't be trusted. We, our news is not as good, the quality itself. So overall, while we are monetizing, let's also be credible. Thank you so much. I'll take questions if there are any, and thank you for listening. Well, Teresa, thank you very much uh, for giving us the, you know, the contextual landscape of what's happening uh, within the topic, but particularly within uh, Malawi as well. How versus thriving. <laughs> so um, talk to us about just, you know, as the people obviously are sending in questions uh, and you're talking about this idea of surviving, but having what we spoke about yesterday, the imperative, the integrity, um, how do we balance those things out? Because I think one of the biggest concessions that we have to admit, particularly today, is that media is a business. And it's our business to engage in ways that ensure media sustainability. But, but how does that resource uh, uh, integrity relationship work uh, because it seems like you need a lot of inputs you need capacity as you're talking about you need infrastructure as you're talking about so how do we maintain not just the media sustainability but link that to the issue of integrity yeah so the, the first thing that I think um, uh, I, I will answer this in relation to what is happening in Malawi. Um, uh, and, and, and I think it kind of also speaks to what may also be happening in other countries. One thing that, that we are not doing very well um, uh, as a media sector is self-regulation. You know, we have not demonstrated that we can on our own, make sure that we are holding each other accountable, making sure that, you know, we, for those that are not um, conducting themselves as expected to the expectation of the ethical standards, that we should be able to um, uh, discipline each other and make sure that we're giving out a product that is, is quite credible. And what we are doing in Malawi, we have a council um, uh, called the Media Council of Malawi. And uh, we are trying to make sure that number one, the general public trusts the media council in terms of its, um, its capabilities uh, to hold the media in Malawi accountable. And, and that also helps in terms of making sure that while we are advocating for media independence, we are also making sure that uh, we are uh, being accountable, held accountable by the general public. So number one is self-regulation, really, uh, strengthening the processes of self-regulation to hold each other accountable and really making sure that people should be able to see that where we are not uh, conducting ourselves professionally, um, uh, they are consequences. Uh, which we, we really have not really demonstrated at, at, at this particular time. And if we don't demonstrate that, unfortunately, governments may come in. And when governments come in, it will both have negative consequences on our independence, even our viability as a business. Uh, because there will be a lot of um, limitations at the, that the government may put in place. So we really have I think the biggest answer, it goes back to demonstrating that we can self-regulate and we can make sure that um, we uh, maintain the standards and where one of us uh, misbehaves, we are able to um, bring them back, <laughs> uh, bring them back to uh, the, the professional standards and people are able to see that, you know, uh, we can trust the media. And that way is where we can bring back the trust and of course be able to monetize uh, um, the service that we're offering or the products um, uh, that we may have. That's, that would be my biggest um, response at, at, at this particular time. And uh, just making sure that self-regulation is something that we are advancing for uh, trust back in the media. And of course, that would translate into monetizing the sector as a business. Interesting when you, when you spoke about um, you know, your examples of I have, uh, you spoke about Zodiac, very like locally grounded grassroots movements. Uh, yesterday, I brought up the question of digital colonialization, uh, particularly when we're looking at um, Facebook's, Twitter's, 
how do we maintain that relationship between developing our own platforms that might not have as far of a reach, but starting early enough? And then, like you're saying, iHub was not a thing in 20, uh, November 2019. Uh, but then, obviously, there, you know, there's an impetus uh, uh, as a result of COVID-19. So, so my question really looks at how do we not, is it a balancing act? Is it a prioritization act? Is it, uh, well, it is what it is. Uh, <laughs> you know, like, uh, how do we, how do we? Put yeah. 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 So, so I, I think yes. Um, you mentioned digital colonization on the first day, and and that really got me interested. Um, in that. Um, I I think we we don't have uniform responses um, in terms of how to monetize uh, certain things. So we can't just say you know this worked in 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 the uk so it will work in malawi we are unique in that sense um as i said already the access is different the cost is different even the usage of the plat different platforms if you look at um the, i was looking at certain statistics where they're talking about first usage of facebook for instance in malawi it's it's just a small number when you compare to the same uh, usage of Facebook, say in in the Netherlands, so it's 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 quite different. We are unique, so we can't just borrow uh, certain things that are are working elsewhere uh, to bring them back home. They may work, but we also need to de definitely adapt them to the local context, and that is why I think um, the the homegrown solutions seem to be working a bit better um, in the context of Malawi, um, other than uh, something that may just be uh, adapted as, as it is and as it is working elsewhere. Um, so local, local contextualization is very, very important. Looking at our local context and what may work is very, very critical. And that is where I think uh, create, creativity is, is uh, very paramount. Uh, for us to look at, really analyze the audiences, I think it was, uh, is it um, our keynote speaker? Um, uh, she mentioned on the first day um, that we really need to um, speak to the audience, our audience. So the audiences are totally different when you talk of different countries. So what is your, what are the needs of your audience? Unless you adapt your solution to your particular audience, it won't work uh, because you will just be um, targeting a, a, an audience else that is elsewhere and not necessarily your audience. So it's very important for us to analyze our own audiences and speak to the needs of those audiences. Um, and that's why I also picked the example of the SMSs. It's a very simple, simple um, platform, but working very well for the rural masses, actually. Well, I think very insightful in terms of, you know, I think a lot of the times people are looking for panaceas, one size fit all, uh, you know, we don't contextualize, we don't localize, we don't look at the other kind of ecosystem uh, that, that enables and then what drives this. So my final question is, what drives monetization? I know we've been emphasizing this. It's about the story. Um, what about the story? That's my closing question and any of your final remarks. Yeah, so I, I, I will borrow what uh, what Paula said. Um, uh, storytelling definitely has to be um, uh, quite interesting, quite unique, professional, and very, very ethical uh, for us to monetize that particular product. In other words, we are selling um, a product or a service here, and no one is looking for a poor product to buy. If we go for on the, on the market, if you're buying tomato, you're obviously looking for quality tomato for you to buy. So obviously that also speaks volumes of what product that we want to sell um, in, in, in the media sector. Um, uh, so we definitely need to make sure that our service, our product is of high quality, something that is very credible in the days of disinformation, misinformation, fake news, let's be unique we need to sell something that is can stand out um, and that is why i mean that it will be very easy for money to come in if they know that our product is of high value uh teresa thank you very much it's been very insightful i think my takeaway um is very much about uh, this unique value proposition that media outlets, that journalists need to position themselves, need to connect to communities, and essentially need to 
being have integrity in, in telling their stories that are uh, you know really meaningful in, in shaping people's lives. So thank you. That was our session on media survival in the digital era. Like I said, it is a surviving time and not necessarily just a thriving time. But 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 those things will come. We had the example of iHub, and I think there is a changing ecosystem. Uh, thank you very much, Teresa. Siveza <laughs> Sivuselela ukutembega. <laughs>